So um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, my name is Dinah Becht, and I'm the district attorney for Contra Costa County. And October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And so it is truly my pleasure to extend a heartfelt welcome to all of you to the Family Violence Community Forum and Resource Fair. I want you all to know that this is actually the very, very first of its kind in Contra Costa County. And we're right here in Antioch. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. As we uh, attempt to bring resources here to East County to address what family violence looks like and how Contra Costa County responds to family violence and to raise awareness about the wide range of resources in our community, resources for intervention, resources for prevention, and resources that help keep our communities safe. You know, there are more than one in three women, that's about 35%, and more than one in four men, about 28% in the United States who have experienced rape, physical violence, and are stalking by an intimate partner in their lifetime. And every nine seconds, these are the alarming statistics, every nine seconds we find out that a woman has become a victim of assault. The district attorney's office receives domestic violence cases from law enforcement referrals all over the county. However, a few months ago in our office, we noticed that we had an uptick in the number of cases that we were receiving for domestic violence from the East County area. And so I called our justice partners to come and think about this with me as I envisioned an awareness raising that would focus on Contra Costa County's very coordinated approach to family violence. And when I called on our justice partners, as you can see, they came to the table. Because first of all, I called them because we can do nothing without our strong collaborations. And here we are today. And speaking of our partners, um, there's many of them that will be introduced as we go along today. But I know that many of you have also taken note of all of the wonderful um, partners who have set up resource tables outside as well. I do want to uh, acknowledge all of our uh, law enforcement agencies that have helped to partner and bring us here today. Antioch Police Department, I know you're in the room somewhere, Bay Area Rapid Transit, Brentwood Police Department, and I know I saw Chief Hampson, Hansen here somewhere. Yes, here he is over there. Thank you. Contra Costa District Attorney's Office, Chief Paul Mulligan is here. The Contra Costa County Sheriff's Department is with us. The Oakley Police Department is here. Pittsburgh Police Department is with us as well. And so again, I want to say thank you to all of you who um, have come to help make this such a successful event. And if I could, for just a few moments, I would also like to acknowledge all of those from the District Attorney's Office who have also helped to make today successful. Dana, Dana Filkowski, who heads uh, our Domestic Violence Unit, and she uh, will have the new task in just a few days of coordinating our first human trafficking unit uh, in Contra Costa County. Dana Filkowski. We have Liz, where are you Liz? She's just an amazing powerhouse who works on so many different things. Uh, Laura, Isabel, uh, Natasha, Glenn, Scott Alonzo, and I think I saw Dan Cabral come in as well, Assistant DA. And I'm sorry if I've missed anyone who might be here. I also want to thank our amazing Blue Ribbon panel of experts uh, from community-based organizations, from law enforcement, and from prosecution. And they will be moderated by KTVU's Candace Nguyen. So we have a wonderful resource fair, and I hope you've had a chance to see more than the 20 uh, providers who are on hand to explain and talk about the services that are available here in Contra Costa County. So without further ado, I'd like to bring up our supervisor, Diane Burgess. Good evening. So happy to uh, offer you a warm East County welcome. And uh, we are so excited that we will be opening a new Family Justice Center at the beginning of next year. So we're re really excited about that. I want to thank uh, District Attorney Becton for organizing this. You know, there's so many great things going on in East County. So when we can show, put a light on it, it's, 
it's always a valuable thing. We have some elected leaders here that I'd like to recognize. We have City Council Member Monica Wilson. And Councilwoman Lori Ogerchuk. And then I also have um, Superintendent of Brentwood Schools, Dana Eaton. You know, interpersonal violence presents difficult challenges, but we can overcome them by working together. And I'm committed to continuing that to bring more resources to East County. And it takes a bunch of different people. It's not just government. It's not just law enforcement. It's not just nonprofits. It's all of us coming together and being one. And that's what you're going to see tonight. So I'm really excited to be on the board of the Family Justice Center, and I'm very proud to be a part of this evening, and I'd like to welcome you. And I'm going to turn it over to someone that I uh, admire quite a bit, and I've been using him as a model to bring Family Justice Center to East County, Assemblymember Tim Grayson. Thank you, Supervisor Burgess, and what a delight it is to be here tonight with my colleagues, my elected friends, and uh, D.A. Becton, congratulations on doing a, a fantastic job, especially in focusing in this area uh, of public safety and lives and people. And really, this is about saving lives. It, and that was the whole seed that was planted in my heart. And I want to give a lot of credit to Devora for kind of holding my hand and carrying me through the whole beginning process back in Concord when I was on city council. And uh, the chief looked at me and said, you're chaplain of the Concord PD. Why don't you do something about domestic violence? I'm like, you're the chief. Why don't you do something about it? And uh, so we kind of laughed about it. And he said, seriously, and coming up from San Diego, uh, where there was a premier family justice, and he said, uh, I would like to partner with you. And together, the chief and I uh, worked very hard under some great guidance of, of friends to be able to open up the family justice center and Susan Kim, you are just an angel from heaven that walks on water. How you've come in and really made it such a success. And without you, without the support that I have received from the DA's office, as well as the help prior and the chief, I would have never been able to, first of all, joint uh, uh, co-open or, or open up the Family Justice Center in Concord, but neither would I have been able to succeed in what we did last year that was unprecedented. And that was to get the state of California to put up $10 million for family justice centers all across the state of California. <laughs> family, family violence is real. Domestic violence is real. And here's the most unfortunate thing, is that many people that are impacted by that have come to accept it as a norm in their life. It doesn't have to be a norm. They don't have to be a statistic. As a matter of fact, and I think it's appropriate that we have educators in the house, Lynn Mackey and, and uh, Superintendent, uh, it, it's, it, it's where it starts right in school and helping them and educating our children to know that violence in the home is not okay, it's not normal, and we don't have to live that way. That's what we're here for tonight. Thank you to all the providers, service providers, to public safety. You all are heroes. And to everybody that's worked together to make this come to pass. DA, you're awesome. Thank you very much. Just a couple of more welcomes, and then we're going to get started with our program. So Chief Hansen's going to come up, followed by Sassoon. We cannot have a program without Sassoon saying a word. Thank you, DA Beckton. Hello, everyone. Thank, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. Hey, we went to the stand luncheon last week. What a, great, uh, what a great event that was for you that were there. I think there was over 500 people there, Four, 400 people, so great. And uh, Suzanne was great and gracious at uh, giving my city manager and me a tour of the Family Justice Center in uh, Concord, and we're really looking forward to uh, that uh, building being built in Antioch. We're looking forward to uh, using that as a, as, a, as a resource in East County. So thank you for that, son. And uh, I would just like to reiterate what the assemblyman said, that uh, domestic violence is real. Um, for the city of Brentwood, as you know, uh, bedroom community. So we've been dealing with domestic violence a lot through the years. I've been there for 25 years. And I think we are making some great uh, headways on that, but we can always do better. Um, I don't like to hear that we're on an uptick, but uh, DA Becton's doing a great job of showing some light on that and of being very aggressive on that. And I know my police officers that are over here are very committed to um, fighting domestic violence and family violence. 
and we're committed to support everyone in this room here today. So we're available. Thank you for coming today, and thank you, DA Becton, for all your hard work. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see everyone. And uh, when um, DA Becton asked me to actually say a few words, I was like, I purposely did not put my name on the program. I wanted to be in the background, but here I am. Um, so I am the director of the Family Justice Center, which is one-stop center of the, uh, for domestic violence uh, and sexual assault, child abuse, elder abuse, and human trafficking victims. So we say five different types of violence. So we opened our first center in Richmond in 2011 as a pilot center. We opened one day a week, and then we moved to Concord and opened a full, full on center like in three months. So uh, assembly person Tim Grayson made me work really hard and we actually had, put, had, had to open a center in three months. So that was in 2015. And then early next year, we are coming to East County to you all. So we would like all of you to learn more about the Family Justice Center. We will welcome all of you. We are going to have a grand opening with better food, I promise you. <laughs> and we would really like all of you to learn more about what is domestic violence, what is family violence, and what resources there are. And that's why we have this amazing panel today. So uh, thank you all for being here. And without uh, too much more conversation, I want to give it to uh, one more thing from uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that we all, thank you, Sassoon, that we also have with us today Erica Rodriguez from Assemblyman Jim Frazier's office is here. And uh, our chief of probation, uh, Todd Belici, is here as well in the back. So now, um, I uh, want to say that I think we are so, so very lucky not only to have the panel that we have, but to have the moderator that we have tonight who has such a passion for the work that we're here to discuss. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Candace Nguyen. Thank you so much, Diana. So my goal here tonight is to have a guided conversation so we can get your questions asked. We were just introduced by to so many of the panelists, the experts, elected officials, the law enforcement officials, but the reason why we're all here is for you, the public, to get some of these questions asked. And some of the questions that stuck out to me and hearing from the public was questions about what if you know a victim and they share his or her story and tells you not to tell? What if there's kids involved? What if those who want to call law enforcement but they're afraid of their immigration status? Uh, when law enforcement arrives, is someone arrested? What can police, what can they not do? Um, so I, I want this to be an interactive conversation as well. I will help guide it with certain topics that we have um, in the conversation. But if there are questions that you have, uh, please raise your hands. Uh, remember, if you have a private matter that you want to get specific answers about that'll best fit you, uh, these officials will stick around and talk to you privately, and that might be the best way. But if you have a general question about how the process works, what to expect, we welcome those kinds of questions. So now that we have the panelists sitting down, I want to introduce, we've in, we know them, but just so I'll, one more time, I'm going to do a quick run through so you know exactly who's answering which question. And maybe if a follow-up question, you'll know who to go to ex, um, right after. So I know uh, Diana's behind you, so she's the, the, our district attorney of Contra Costa County. So... Is she gonna be a panelist? Well, all right, so, uh, but she's around. So right here to my right, we have Dana Filkowski. She's the supervising prosecutor at the Contra Costa's Domestic Violence Unit. Um, and then to her right, we have Rhonda James, the executive director of STAND, a domestic violence reduction agency that specializes, of course, in addressing domestic violence, but also child abuse. And then to her right at the end of this table, we have Devorah Levine with the Contra Costa Alliance to End Abuse. And then over at that table right there, we have Kevin McAllister. He's executive director of the Rainbow Community Center, an LGBTQ community center to help weigh in on those issues that we need to hear more about. And then to his right, we have Officer Nicole Riddick, an officer with the Pittsburgh Police Department. She can really talk about the first response, what to expect um, if a call is made. And finally, at the end of that table, we have Detective Jason Vanderpool with the Antioch Police Department. Um, so let's start off with the first question of just giving us sort of a, a wrapping our heads around this of what does domestic violence look like? We know on TV we hear of maybe the husband abusing the wife. 
But is that what it is? And wh are there some misconceptions, some misunderstandings, or things the public needs to know about? So let's start, um, let's first start with Rhonda James or Stan. Um, what does domestic violence look like here? Domestic violence in Contra Costa County looks like it looks in every other county. We have nuances in this county based on who lives here and the resources available. So what we know is exactly what the national statistics tell us, that everyone from every group, from every ethnicity, from every gender um, has a, an experience of domestic violence in their, in their community at the same rate. What is different is those folks who have resources and access to intervention and access to um, ways to increase safety or to stop the violence. So that's what's different community to community. So that's where I'll start. Yeah, you can jump in. Why do you have me? Oh, okay, I'm being directed by the DDA. So I, I have learned. Bossy. She's bossy. We, li we like that about you. So where's my clicker? Okay, great. So, so, um, so our district attorney went over the statistics and I don't think we need to go over all of those again. But what I can tell you is Stan is a community-based organization. We've been around for 41, 42 years. We have been doing this work before, be, be, before God left Chicago. We, we, we've been doing this work as part of the movement to end violence against women. We've been partnering with law enforcement that entire time. We've been partnering with the district attorney. We could have done none of our work without them. We're in an interesting relationship because sometimes we find ourselves on different sides of an issue. And our job is to work together to make sure that there's safety for every victim, that he or she gets to do and manage her experience the way she needs to, and law enforcement still does what it needs to do in terms of being in compliance with the law. And the long-term goal is to make everybody safe because we know that with family violence becomes community violence. There aren't too many dots in between. We know that there's a connection. What I can say is that we are seeing an uptick sometimes, I believe, because we've gotten really good at identifying it. Law enforcement has gotten really good at asking the right questions. They get better every year. We all get better every year. We've gotten really good at looking past what the barriers are, that domestic violence happens in same gender families. It happens in large families. It happens in Latino families. It happens in, in wealthy families. It happens in all families. So what, what I want you to know about STAND is that we're a comprehensive shelter-based organization. So while we provide emergency shelter and transitional housing, and I only have six minutes, so it's going to be fast. <laughs> While we provide that, most of the folks we see, and we get about 15,000 calls a year on our 24-hour crisis line, most of the folks who call us may not be ready to leave their home, may not be ready to exit the relationship. So a lot of what we do is work with law enforcement and the victim or survivor to figure out a safety plan until he or she might be ready to make a, to make a change. We also know that there are lots of children who are exposed to domestic violence, and we know it has dreadful impacts. On their, on their outcomes, their health outcomes, and their mental health outcomes. So I'm, I'm happy to say that STAN does prevention, intervention, and treatment. We're mostly known for our intervention. We're the folks that answer the phone 24-7. But I'm very proud to say that we're in a number of schools. We do a lot of prevention work based on gender-based violence prevention, healthy forms of masculinity, learning how to be in relationship without, without violence. We also have a great deal of, of treatment work that we do, especially in our child clinics in West, Central, and East County. Our office is in East County, just moved to Hillcrest. Uh, we offer community-based uh, support groups, advocacy work, and around-the-clock uh, response. So that's kind of a general sense of what we do. The 2,000 here are the youth that we see in local high schools and middle schools and community colleges. You want to click one? So we've already gone through this. All kinds of abuse, everything from spiritual abuse to economic abuse. We also see elders who are in an experience of domestic violence with, an, with, a, with interpersonal violence with a partner. We are seeing lots of teen violence with cyber harassment and uh, sharing porn and those kinds of activities that, that sometimes young people will participate in as a way to control or have power over. So we won't list all these because you all know them. Can you click me here? So this is just a general idea of how we save lives in our intervention, 24-hour crisis line. We do a lethality assessment protocol program, and I'm proud to say we're in three law enforcement organizations, one right here in East County. Thank you, Brentwood. Uh, we're part of a pilot program, one of four in the entire country. We've just added a fourth, or in the process of adding a fourth, Dan Ramon, and that's to do an immediate uh, lethality assessment for those cases where either law enforcement or the victim believes that there's a chance that she's going to die at the hand of her abuser. We're finding we can save lives and prevent homicide, which ultimately is what a lot of us want to be doing. 
So that particular program has been really, really uh, successful in identifying those people who might be dying um, at the hand of their abuser. All of these, all of these other uh, services, restraining order, assistance clinics, victim advocacy before, during, and after, can I click me through? And in our prevention, we're mostly school-based. We do, we do serve all genders. We do a lot of work with young men. We do a lot of young, uh, work with young men of color and really working through those stereotypes about what relationships have to be for, for some of our young men. Our Youth Against Violence Leadership Program and our, our Youth Education Support Services, our after-school programs. Again, these programs are predominantly at this point in West County, some in East. Happy to say we're in Pittsburgh. And then treatment, transitional housing. So when victims are with us for they can be with us for eight to 12 weeks and they decide they wanna do a transitional housing experience on the same campus. We have units where they can stay for up to two years where they and their children can pull their lives back together. Wraparound services, really helping create a, an opportunity for them to return to work, their children to return to school, for their wounds to heal. Um, a lot of counseling if, if that's what's required and needed. A nonviolence intervention treatment program, something that we've actually always done and a lot of our, our partners have also participated in, but really this next year stressing working with those who do harm. And for the most part, we're seeing men in those, group, in those groups who do harm. They used to be called batters intervention programs, um, domestic violence treatment programs, really working with people who are trying to stop their own pattern of violence in, in families. So that, that's a big, a big order. How you can help, you're gonna hear this over and over. Educate yourself, speak out for yourself speak out for someone else, learn how to do a really gentle, warm handoff intervention. Don't be afraid to say something. Give of your time and your talent and even your treasure. Uh, join us, join one of the groups here, volunteer with us, and continue to speak up. Thank you. Are you next? <laughs> it's your slide, Kevin oh, McAllister. Okay, I guess I'm next. <laughs> there you go. Excellent, thank you. Were there you have questions for me? <laughs> I'm Kevin McAllister. I'm the uh, executive director of the Rainbow Community Center of Contra Costa County. Uh, I've been with the organization for about five months now, and uh, Sue's son made me come here. Um, <laughs> I actually ran the Justice Center in Solano County for a couple of years and really enjoyed that relationship, and, and all of the wonderful organizations out here is what brought me to Contra Costa County. Um, one of the major you know, myths um, is that um, Intimate partner violence doesn't exist in the LGBTQ community. That, you know, you look at the movement, you look at all the marketing and advertising, you see, you know, straight couples, right? Because that's, that's where it happens. But we see a lot of young people, a lot of families that come to the center for support um, because of intimate partner violence. And a lot of them come to our center because we have well-trained staff members that are affirming, welcoming. Um, and that's not something that they experience when they go out to outside agencies. And so, you know, because of that, we do work closely with a lot of our partners um, that are on this panel, actually, to make sure that they receive the training and the connections and, you know, updated information, literature, laws, so that they can better support folks when they come to their centers. Um, I'll take it, Susan. Thank you. But um, are you seeing anything new and unique now, uh, challenges facing that are making it harder for victims? To, it's already hard already, but are you seeing within the community you work with, but also just currently that's making it more difficult, additional challenges for victims to speak out? Oh, yeah, internet. I didn't have internet either. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, we do have a, young, a lot of young people that reach out to us, you know, via email, you know, our, our crisis line. Uh, we work closely with the California Youth Crisis Line too, and that's where we get a lot of our referrals for young people that are being bullied. Um, but nothing, no unique challenges in regards to young people reaching out. And usually domestic violence, you think it's your parents, but what ages are, are you seeing people coming oh, in and gosh. saying they have cases and they need help? I mean, 13, 14, we, a, a lot, you know, and, and for young people it's really different because they don't understand what's going on is actually bullying or, or intimate partner violence, you know, when you're getting, you know, where are you, what are you doing, who are you with, you don't love me, you know, all of those 
things that we talk about during teen dating, you know, violence awareness month, um, just educating them. Are you finding in the LGBTQ community over the past few years, uh, people reaching out for help is increasing or is it still a challenge? I think it's increasing because there's, you know, a different level of acceptance. You know, it's really, you know, I graduated from high school in 99 and, and then, you know, no one was out. I mean, on campus in Solano County, you know, oh, I'm gay. I was, but I didn't say anything. Um, you know, and then I see all these young people and they're, they're out and they have these challenges, but they know where to come now for services and they feel a lot safer. Um, we do a lot of training in the community for, for educators and we partner with the school districts to go in, talk to the teachers, you know, staff, faculty, administrators, and, and share with them ways in which they can engage with young people from the LGBTQ uh, community. And Kevin, I want to ask you this as well as uh, Devorah, as well with the Contra Costa Alliance and Abuse. And I know there might be some slides because these organizations are introducing you what the resources they have, and then we'll continue the kind of Q&A questions. But I think a lot of people, when they reach out, they're so worried about privacy. When I make this call to law enforcement, this is going to change my life, my children's life. Everything is going to change. How real is that fear? And what about concerns of privacy? And if they call you, will their lives turn around and suddenly law enforcement comes in, make an arrest, and daddy's no longer here? How real are those concerns, and how is it playing out in real life? It's very real. I mean, and especially with being outed and, you know, working in the community, you know, being connected. I myself was in a relationship where there was violence and, you know, like who do I reach out to because everyone knows me in this community, you know, is it, it will that be confidential, you know, that's, that's the, the worry. And then, yeah, you know, it's, are there I think any it's any assurances, uh, things you can tell the law, law enforcement agents or, you know, anyone can, can answer this. But from the prosecution perspective, victims of sexual assault and domestic violence are entitled by law to confidentiality. And the way we translate that into reality in a prosecution is I plead the case, uh, the victim is pled as confidential victim. The names are not used. Um, when children are involved, we plead the names of children as John Doe or Jane Doe. If there are multiple children, they're John Doe 1, John Doe 2, John Doe 3. Our courts really respect that. So if we have to say the name of the child out loud in court so that we're making a record and we're identifying it, the, tr the court reporter will transcribe that name as John Doe or Jane Doe. And both parties, the prosecution and the defense, will be ordered by the court not to use the names of the parties in pleadings. Um, so if somebody opens up the public court file to look to see who the victim is, they're not going to see that. I was, I was going to actually add for you, no, I know, right, now, is that uh, the other, uh, just to build on what Jana said, too, is that the, um, you know, if you were to call, for example, Stan's domestic violence hotline and speak to a domestic violence advocate, um, you know, there are protections in the law that protect the communications that you have with someone who's a certified domestic violence advocate. But, you know, the thing I just wanted to add is that, you know, um, it, this is a very difficult thing to disclose to anyone. And um, in the years that I've worked with people who are experiencing violence or who have harmed people too, um, making the decision about what is safe for you or what will help you end the violence is unique to every person and every family. Um, and we'll talk about like who can you go to and there are options in terms of having safe conversations that are protected, but also figuring out who you can reach out to and trusting your sense of what will be safe for you um, is really important, but to not suffer in silence or by yourself. Um, this is very important to make that call yourself and find the right person to talk with who can get you some help. I wanted to add that what we do know is that the most dangerous time and the time that you're most likely to be killed by the hands of your partner is when you leave in those first few hours, that first 72 hours. We know that's true. We know that our victim survivors are brilliant, that they already know that there's a really good chance they're going to get hurt or killed. So what we do is we work with you to figure out the safety plan, and law enforcement will work with you to work out the safety plan. It doesn't mean that everything is handled the exact same way, and I think that's what you're talking about, Devorah, that every case is different, and it's based on the brilliance of the, of the person who's impacted. She or he gets to decide how to move that through for the most part, and the, conf the conversations are absolutely confidential, and the way that we keep um, our records and our files 
is confidential as relegated by law. So. I think one of the big concerns I heard was, I'm afraid to call because that will further anger my abuser. And then something bad, really bad will happen, worse than it is. So um, that you go at your own pace. So taking back off that question uh, that I had, I have a question about if you're not the victim, but you're a friend, because it's so hard to come forward, and you're the mom, the girlfriend, uh, the brother, and you hear that your loved one is a victim, or you sense that they're a victim of domestic violence, and that person tells you not to tell. As a community member, what are you supposed to do? What can you do? What should you do? You start off with a confidential conversation on the telephone that's not monitored, that's not, that, that's not disclosed to anyone, and you come up with a safety plan. And maybe that safety plan is that you don't leave now. Maybe that safety plan is packing a specific kind of bag with your prescription medication in it. Safety plan about knowing where your money is, to know what the plan is to get out of the house safely. And for some victims, it's not time to get out. Sometimes they will be harmed as they leave. As a friend, though, are you obligated to say something? <laughs> obligated? Ethically or morally or legally? No. I think the most frustrating calls I get and the ones where my heart bleeds the most because I'm also a parent are moms who call and say, I have a 19-year-old daughter and she won't leave him. And he's, he's kicked her behind six times and she says she loves him and she's worth more than this. She was raised better. I'm just telling you what folks say. Why can't you do something? Why can't you intervene? Why can't you get law enforcement to intervene? We have to talk a lot about who the adult is and how much power individuals have and really working with folks to get ready to do a safety plan one inch at a time. So if you're a community member, if you're a parent, you can call the crisis line and you, we can help talk you through some options. But are you required to report? No. So I'll, I'll add to that because what I've got from my law enforcement partners is they're responding to the same families over and over and over again. And the frustration is why won't she leave? Uh, why won't he change? And if you saw the artwork out front, those are the themes uh, that were being developed in the artwork. These are very difficult conversations for us to have as a community. It's easy for us to blame when we're not in that situation. And what I've learned from doing this for three years and working with all of these amazing partners is victims aren't ready to be victims on my timetable or on the timetable of law enforcement or when an intervener is ready to be there with services, support, and help. I've talked to family members who, and I've, I've, sent my, I've trained my detectives to go back and ask the victim, when this happens, who do you call? Our victims usually have one person that'll be the person they always call. And it's someone they say, I gotta tell you something, you can't tell anyone. They send selfies, look what he did to me now. They send emails with pictures and they say, when she kills me, I want you to know. And we're trying to have that conversation of let us help you before that happens, please. This is where we talk to our partners about we want to be homicide prevention, not homicide response. And how do we do that? We have a very difficult homicide case from Richmond that I'm prosecuting right now where uh, Rashonda Franklin was shot in the head by her boyfriend as she was leaving him in front of her five and eight-year-old sons. He waited for her in the parking lot. Um, and this is a case that will probably be going to trial soon. It's important to us as a response community because she had been to the Family Justice Center and we were devastated because why couldn't we help her? And what we learned was she was a person who valued strength. And so the conversation becomes, how do we help women who want to be strong? How do we help men where strength is such an important part of masculinity? How do you get people to accept a weakness in asking for help? And we're trying to find a way to tell survivors and their family members that it takes even more strength sometimes to ask for help than to suffer in silence. The only thing I would add there is there's a humiliation factor. And I think you were referring to that, Devorah, in, in disclosing that something's happened in your family often brings shame on the family, that we're not a good family or that we don't do this in this family, and we know that it crosses every boundary. You have to sit there and listen. I would imagine in the immigrant groups where they are typically more private and everyone has, has this good sense, but you keep it in the family. It's shameful to like, how are you, if we, uh, the outreach of the first immigrant group, how is that going? So for us as a nonprofit, we work with other, um, with other community-specific organizations. For instance, where groups um, are coming in newer. So the newest, most kind of recent immigration group of immigration oftentimes has the least amount of information, right? So I don't know that it falls within a certain ethnicity, but more how new you are to, to, the, to the ways that we work in this particular community. Um, we do see a, a huge amount of reluctance to report in communities where there's the patriarchy is strong, 
where speaking out against a brother or a partner or a lover means that your father has shame. Speaking out at all means that you're bringing shame to the family. And you, you see that in lots of, of different, I don't want to mention ethnicities because I think it's, it, it, it resides in, in many. But we are finding that more and more folks are willing to speak up, but they also want to speak up to someone who speaks the language they speak, who wears the, 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 the cultural garb they, they wear. And so we want to make sure that we have appropriate staff and volunteers who can really reflect for them um, surviving within the community, within their own community. I wanted to bring in um, some of the law enforcement officials at the end of that table. Uh, if you can explain to us, and maybe can we hand that microphone down to them? Uh, can you walk us through if someone does get to that point? Well, you know, hope we all hope that it's prevention and they get in touch with one of these organizations so it never gets to that point. But let's say there's a really bad fight uh, or neighbors call 911 and you respond to that house, there's broken glass or whatever signs there are. Can you walk us through one of your calls um, so people here can learn, uh, hear about either what to expect or what kind of, what happens? Can we take the end of Dave's, Jason's presentation? Oh, and have him start with Jason and we'll open up the Hello, I'm Jason Vanderpool. I work with the Antioch Police Department. And again, thanks for having me here. Appreciate it. Um, before I was asked to do this, I pulled up some stats just so everybody knew, and I kind of educated myself. Um, just in the city of Antioch, since the year 2017 till today, we've had over 3,500 calls of domestic violence, which I was surprised to hear that myself. Um, my job today is to kind of explain what we do with patrol officers and how it gets to the, in the hands of the detectives. So there's a lot of ways that we receive calls for domestic violence. It could be the victim calling, the victim's kids, a family member who discussed it that could have happened previously. Um, we have mandated reporters that report these incidences, uh, doctors, a dentist call us, counselors, teachers. They come in all walks of life. Sometimes we get a, I, I would call it a lone domestic violence. Somebody will I witness someone getting assaulted while they're driving a car and someone will make that call, get a license plate, and we follow up on everything. Families show up in the lobby of uh, Antioch Police Department, you know, daily. So from there, as an officer responding to the scene, the first thing we do is uh, make sure everyone's safe, everyone's separated, make sure the perpetrator's not there. If he left, that's something we have to determine because domestic violence calls is the most dangerous call for a law enforcement officer. So when we get there, we separate everybody, get their information. We have to determine if a fact of crime did occur and the level of the crime. And a lot of times that's determined based off the severity of the injury. Sometimes we go to domestic violence calls where it's just a simple verbal altercation and they call the kids, get afraid, the police come in and you know a lot of times we're just counselors and mediators and we settle it and all parties will remain at home. But if there's an assault that takes place, you know, our job is to, again, make sure the family's safe, to get medical attention if there's anything that needs to be done about that. Um, get everyone's information, record everybody's statement for court purposes, because sometimes domestic violence victims are afraid to testify in court. So we take our statements, we record it, so it will later help us in court. Um, if in Antioch, I don't know, I can't speak for every agency. In Antioch, if it's a misdemeanor domestic violence, the patrol officer will pretty much handle that invas investigation from beginning to end. If the guy or girl, whoever the assailant is, is not on scene, they will you know, do the work to try to locate the other half of the incident. If it, li if it rises to the level of a felony incident, then it goes into the hands of our detectives. Again, the detectives will follow up with the victim, the victim's kids, uh, get them in contact with all the advocates, which is great to have there, huge help for us. And we always call Stan on every call before we leave, I, th I believe that's mandated now. Even if the victim doesn't want us to call, we still make the call and provide them with the information. So then from there, <clears throat> the detective will take over. Um, if the subject's not in custody, they will um, issue like probable cause if it exists, um, follow up with the victim, they even go to so far as if the victim has talked to anyone else about the situation. We, we will even contact those people, even if they're not witnesses. Um, and then we just 
together the best case that we can to present it to the DA. That's pretty much in a nutshell. It's very short. There's a lot that goes into it. Antioch takes it very serious. All, I mean, all agencies in Contra Costa County do take it very serious because domestic violence is definitely real. We see it every single day. And um, one good thing about the Family Justice Center opening in Antioch is it's going to be a lot more, it's going to be more accessible for the victims to get the help that they need. Because a lot of times, speaking with victims on calls, um, you know, you want to give them all the resources. We give them the victim of violent crimes information. We get them in contact with Stan. We explain how to get restraining orders. And a lot of times, the work has to be done in Martinez, and it's an inconvenience for them. They have no way of getting there. But when this Family Justice Center opens up in Antioch, it's going to be a huge benefit for the victims. And so every, everyone's excited that it's going to happen. What's one of the biggest challenges you face um, doing detective work with domestic violence and information you wish some of the victims you dealt with had or provided you to uh, make the case go a little easier? What's one of the biggest challenges you face? One of the biggest challenges is recontacting that victim and getting her to be cooperative with us. A lot of times victims, they want to recant. They want to take back what they said. So it's really important as us as detectives to try to get them locked into a statement so the case can be you know, dealt with by the DA. That's the absolute biggest challenge. And what are the limitations you face when that person does recant and say, I'm sorry, I changed my mind, I don't want to do it anymore. Um, and everyone has their choice, but there are, there's changes to your direction when that happens. So what are the challenges and what are your limitations when that happens? Well, we're, then we're just stuck with the one statement that they provide us, and that's why we really you know, make sure we record every statement so we have it documented. You know, if you hear it, it's better than reading it off a piece of paper. You can actually hear it. You can hear the emotions going through them. They're crying. They're upset. All that plays a huge part with the jury. And if someone recants but, you know, over time has some healing and comes back to you two years later or a year later and say, okay, I'm now I'm ready, does that evidence go hand in hand with evidence two years later? Is there a limitation where it's been too long, case closed, can't come forward anymore? Depends on the level of the, the crime. The felony, there are two years that definitely still fall within the statute of limitations. Misdemeanor, you have one year from the date of the incident. It's so rare that you have a detective in front of you to answer this question. Does anyone from the audience have any questions? Uh, remember, feel free. I know we're sort of getting in our conversation, but feel free to raise your hands if you have questions. Um, I think. What does it mean to recant? To you, what does it mean to recant? Yeah, recant is taking back what they said. Like they don't want it to happen. They don't. Want, they don't want to follow through with the whole process, because it is a life-changing issue when someone gets assaulted, because their, their whole world's gonna change. The money, the money bread maker could be thrown in jail, mom might not work, or dad might not work, and they don't want that to happen. They don't want their family to be torn apart. They see the, the kids, how they're affected. They're really upset, it's very tragic, you know, seeing the kids, they're, they're really affected by it, and they don't wanna break the family apart. They blame themselves for it, they recant. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have said this, maybe I shouldn't have said that. So they'll recant, they'll call us back and give us a totally different story sometimes, not even close to what we recorded. And I would imagine some victims are saying, uh, I don't remember and I don't remember this. And sometimes they may get something inaccurate, whether uh, it was intentional or unintentional. Uh, what challenges do you face that and, and possibly a victim being so nervous to give a statement because I might not get it right and then that'll be used against me? Right, and that's why when it rises to the level of a felony that our detectives make the phone call to the victim as soon as they can. As soon as they get the case, they make that call almost the same day it's assigned to them because it's still fresh in their mind and you know they probably relive that moment throughout the night and they actually remember things. Even us as peace officers, like we live through a tragic event and then you actually even remember yourself what actually really happened. So it does change the story. It tightens the story up most of the time if you have a cooperative victim. Thank you so much. Was there anything with else with uh, the slides or you wanted to bring up about um, Antioch Police Department and the services you provide? Um, I, th I mean, I think I pretty, it's a very short presentation. There's so much that goes into a domestic violence call and a, in an investigation, but I think the main focus here is the Family Justice Center opening in Antioch because most of the resources seem to be in Martinez and a lot of victims don't reach out 
because of the distance alone, they don't have the means to travel. But I think this Justice Center is gonna, gonna be a huge benefit to and Brentwood, Oak Ridge. And again, the Family Justice Center is a one-stop shop for victims to come forward where you have law enforcement help, where there's social help, uh, where there's prosecutors. It's again, a, a one-stop shop. So uh, all your help is there, or at least people who can refer you in the right direction. Oh, question, please. So the question was, if we've got people who are afraid to reach out and connect to services because of their immigration status, and the number one thing, if we take anything away from this forum today, it should be that no one should be afraid to ask for help. All of the help that's available in Contra Costa County is available regardless of your immigration status, where you were born, your income level, uh, your education level, your race, your ethnicity. The Contra Costa District Attorney's Office, all of our law enforcement partners, all of our community partners, every single one of those places is a safe place for everyone to go for help. I do want to add, we do hear, however, those who've done harm threaten to or actually take papers away. So while, while um, Dana's telling the truth about partners, that is a very real threat that sometimes is acted upon in communities where perhaps one spouse holds papers or holds information. Yeah, and one thing I actually didn't cover, and I apologize, um, we often will get an emergency protective order, and if you don't know what that is, it's a five-day restraining order after the, you know, dust has settled and we have everyone calm, and, you know, we explain to the victim what we can do for them while we're on scene. A lot of times, a victim will request an emergency protection order, and that is something that the law enforcement officer on scene will do. He'll actually contact the judge by telephone even after hours, and we will explain to the judge the situation, the severity of it, the children involved, and 99% of the time, the judge is gonna issue that order based off the circumstances, and a lot of that, that can include an immediate move out of the house, like the perpetrator cannot be allowed to come back to the house, and you know, the, the victim will have custody of the children, like it takes the, the perpetrator out of the scenario completely, and a five-day buffer is a, uh, should give them plenty of time to get the temporary restraining order and deal with child custody issues. I think that's a great segue to actually bring in Officer Nicole Riddick with uh, the Pittsburgh Police Department uh, to talk about when uh, there is a domestic violence incident and there are children involved. Uh, there may be child abuse or maybe children uh, witnessing it. So can you t uh, talk about what you're seeing and some of the impacts uh, in that area? Yes, hello, I'm Nicole Riddick with the Pittsburgh Police Department. I've been an officer for almost 10 years. I was a detective for two of those years and strictly domestic violence detective and investigator for just over a year. Um, and in my 10 years with the department, I'm one officer. I have been to hundreds of domestic violence calls. That's um, for our city. We do have a lot of domestic violence as well as Antioch in our area. So when the children, there's children in the home, um, unfortunately, the ripple effects of domestic violence impact everybody in the home, not just the victim. Even if the kids haven't um, been physically hit or in the arms of the victim when the attack is happening, because that has happened as well, um, it affects them so greatly that children, whether they show it or not, or whether you see it or not, they can experience PTSD. Um, they have behavioral problems. Um, the statistics, unfortunately, looking at children who come from domestic violence homes is that boys are twice as likely when they become uh, men and are in relationships of their own, uh, they're twice as likely to abuse because they've been witness witnessing that as children in their own home, um, whether they're the recipients of the abuse or just seeing it or hearing it, it affects them all. So parents, we, for the police, our primary concern is everybody's safety and to make sure not just the victim but the children as well, if they have witnessed anything when we're on scene, um, we talk to them separately to try and get their statement to include with any type of police report if there's been an altercation involving domestic violence. Um, there's this wonderful, amazing resource that's very little known among the community but within the law enforcement community, it's, it's, 
incredible thing that we use called the Children's Interview Center because a lot of kids are scared of the police. And unfortunately, they've just witnessed a very traumatic, horrifying scene between their parents. And they, they just clam up and don't want to say anything. They're scared. They're crying. And it's hard to get, for us to get information out of them. We're intimidating. We're in a uniform. We do the best we can. But the Children's Interview Center is in place for us to utilize. And it is incredible. A lot of parents don't want the police to talk to their kids. They don't want to re-traumatize them and have them have to talk about something they, they saw again. But it may be imperative to the case um, to testify and get a statement. And so the Children's Interview Center is located in Martinez, and it looks nothing like a police department. It isn't a police department. It's not stark. It's not professional. It's, I mean, it's not not professional. <laughs> it is professional, but at a children's level. It looks like a living room. There's stuffed animals. There's videos. There's coloring books and crayons. There's a couch. It, there's nobody in uniform there to be an intimidating presence. Um, and there are professional forensic interviewers who've been trained to speak specifically to children um, and understand how to question them to get them to talk to them. And I've witnessed them myself. There's a two-way mirror where the officer or detective sits on one side and can hear and see everything that the child is telling the interviewer. So the child has no idea that the officer or detective is listening or watching this whole interview. They're just talking to somebody in regular clothes and coloring crayons and pouring their heart out at times of what they've experienced or gone through um, or witnessed, and that can be so critical in a lot of our cases. So, like I said, it was a specially trained um, interviewer, thanks, and it's all recorded. It's all video recorded, and it's evidence that goes straight from the interview to the police department to the evidence room. Nobody else is privy to it at all. Um, and if it needs to be played in court, then they can utilize that there. So the Family Justice Center offers so many resources on top of that one that I'm discussing as far as counseling services for the children. Um, and they have law specialists and lawyers and attorneys and stuff there available to help walk through the family law side of things because the police officers don't take people to the courthouse to, to file for child custody. Um, and it can be very confusing and overwhelming at times for parents who've gone through this horrible experience, had the police, maybe had somebody arrested, and now to try and deal with the after effects and the aftermath with their children and trying to get them in a safe place to get child custody. Um, the Family Justice Center has advocates there who walk you through the process step by step and make sure that everything gets taken care of so everybody is as safe as possible. Can you talk about how you partner with Children and Family Services? Yes. So anytime there is a domestic violence incident where the police take a report, we are required to send a copy of that report to Child Family Services, formerly known as CPS. It is now CFS. And what we do, we list in the report that a copy of this report will be forwarded to Child Family Services. Um, the officers know to do that, whether um, it gets faxed that night that the report's finished or the report, the records clerks do that at a later time or the detective even does it at a later time. There's definitely several levels where we ensure that every report that involves a child witnessing or experiencing any type of abuse gets forwarded to Child Family Services and that's where we partner with them. Um, to make sure that every level is um, uh, paid attention to. All right. Thank you so much. All right, so we uh, heard a lot from um, the police officers uh, going right to the scene. We heard about the Family Justice Center, but we want to talk about this alliance that really is, it's a multifaceted approach in order uh, to look at domestic violence in a holistic way. Uh, so I want to bring on Devorah Levine to talk more about the alliance that is going on here, uh, how that's all working, and how, how Contra Costa as a county responds to this issue. Um, hi, everyone. So um, I really have a few messages. The first message, I'll tell you a little bit about what the alliance is, but really at the heart of the Alliance to End Abuse is that domestic violence is a community issue. It's all of our issue. And you've heard a little bit about the response and um, what victims experience and people's life experience. Um, and the reality is that um, the health of our relationships 
is related to our health, our ability to um, perform at our job. There's all kinds of ways that it's all very interconnected. So it's, it's something that I hope if you're here um, and either you are here, you're here to learn and you're curious that this is really something that um, we can be talking about more frequently and should be um, and paying attention to. And um, the thing that I want to tell you about is that in Contra Costa County, this is something that um, has really been paid attention to for many, many years, um, building a strong foundation um, with the support of the community um, to improve our response. And many years ago in 2001, our Board of Supervisors um, founded an initiative that at the time was called the Zero Tolerance for Domestic Violence Initiative, which is now called the Alliance to End Abuse. Now, their vision at the time um, was that they were actually responding to community members and advocates who came to them and said, why aren't we paying attention to this issue? Um, we were seeing homicides spike um, in domestic violence cases as our uh, district attorney Becton noted, we were seeing a, a record number of um, misdemeanor um, filings. We were seeing um, a lot happening in the community. And the board decided that it was time to bring all of the systems together that are responsible for responding to domestic violence and have them work in concert. So uh, the Alliance to End Abuse was born at the time. And you know, basically, the alliance, the intention of the alliance is to say that everyone has a role to play. Everyone. So the alliance brings together formal systems like law enforcement, the health system, community advocates, district attorney, criminal justice, because it takes everybody in all of those systems playing different roles to wrap ourselves around the victims, the families, the people who abuse, who want to stop abusing. Um, it takes everyone. So the Alliance to End Abuse is really strengthening systems, building partnerships, and looking to create greater ownership in our county um, so that we send the message that we, um, this issue will not be tolerated in our county and that we're here to um, respond well together and heal. So over the years, um, as I said, it was founded in 2001, there have been many opportunities to create um, new responses. And uh, some of those you've already heard about, so I won't mention them. We um, all worked together to launch the Family Justice Center. Um, we um, helped create multidisciplinary teams where people come together and figure out how we're gonna coordinate information to respond when someone is experiencing abuse. So those are some examples of what we've been up to. The last thing I just wanna close with um, is really this community ownership piece again. So the Alliance to End Abuse, for example, also is trying to carry forward the message of no more. So we will, you know, we've sponsored campaigns like Contra Costa Says No More. And you know, the powerful thing about that is that we've talked a lot about intervening and responding and prosecuting, which is critical. And I wanna add a piece to that, which is prevention. So this idea of prevention is basically how can we stop violence in our homes and interpersonally before it ever starts, before it ever starts. And um, that is a role that everyone can definitely play. Um, and that means knowing when is a healthy relationship. I'm gonna say the word too, that we, how we love each other. That is what will carry us forward too in terms of prevention. And there are so many of you in the room who I see who have done some outstanding effort to reach out to children and teach them early. How do you resolve conflict with, you, with each other? How do you validate your emotions for little boys and little girls so that you're not assuming that your feelings aren't worth noting? So these are the kinds of things too that the Alliance has been working to support behind the scenes, um, bringing partners together, bringing in more resources, trying to support the agencies that you've seen here. They're doing such fantastic work. So I hope the other message is one, 
that we all have a role to play. Two, I hope you can be proud of Contra Costa County. Uh, we've always, people have always told us, you're not doing a very good job marketing your efforts. I've been saying that for many years, but you know, that's not what matters. What really matters is igniting, hopefully all of you, to want to be a part of working together to end domestic violence in our county. So, thank you. Okay, last but not least. So we've heard about the community response. We've heard about what domestic violence looks like in our community. We've heard about the law enforcement response, where it ends up is with the prosecution office. So after a, an episode of domestic violence, where law enforcement is called, where we've had a patrol response from a uniformed officer like Nicole Riddick, and if it's a serious case, a follow-up response by a detective like Jason Vanderpool, their completed investigation comes to my office. In Contra Costa County, it was me reviewing all of the felony domestic violence cases from Central and East County. And the question I get all the time is, why do some cases get filed and some cases do not? In fact, why do I file cases when a victim calls me and says, no, I want to drop charges, I don't want to press charges? Why do I not file a charge or a case when a victim calls and says, but I want you to do that for me? And the answer is, we follow the evidence. In Contra Costa County, we follow the best practice of evidence-based prosecution, which means if, it, if the evidence gathered by our law enforcement partners supports a prosecution and shows me at the time I'm reviewing the case that I can overcome the presumption of innocence that protects all of us from the United States Constitution and prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt to 12 members of this community, then I will file the case. And sometimes the evidence doesn't show me that. Where I can't succeed is when I have one person saying something happened and one person saying it didn't. Does anyone here have more than one child? Yeah, have you ever had, I have twins. One of them says he hit me, the other one says no I didn't. Can I prove what happened? In my house, no. Now, imagine me convincing 12 people beyond a reasonable doubt when the judge starts off pointing at the accused saying you assume he did nothing at all until the person in the purple dress proves beyond a reasonable doubt that he did. So those cases don't get filed. Can we go to our next slide, please? But what you've heard today is this amazing connected response community that we have in Contra Costa County. And so to those victims who call me and are angry when they want a criminal prosecution, I have to let them know that is not the only way for you to get help. I draw triangles all day, every day. To me, the response system in Contra Costa looks like a great big triangle. And the criminal justice system intervention level is the tiny tip, the top of the, of, the, of the triangle. We take the smallest number of cases into the criminal justice system. If you think about it, that's the way it ought to be. Do we need the criminal justice system in everybody's family? We, we don't. In Contra Costa County, we have an amazing network of coordinated and aligned through the Alliance's work over the last almost 20 years, group of responders that have been working together to help families. What we realized, what DA Becton realized with this uptick in cases coming from Central and East County is maybe that message isn't here in East County. So how, how do I tell victims that just because I can't file your case, it doesn't mean there's no help for you. I can have you talk with a confidential domestic violence counselor at Stand. I can have you talk with a uh, family law attorney at the Family Justice Center and get a custody order and eliminate some of these triggers to violence. Um, I refer people to our community partners constantly, often through the Family Justice Center because that's where it's all coordinated from. Um, but we have more than 30 partners at our Family Justice Centers that can address every aspect of violence. Complicated cases, we work together. Monthly, we have a multidisciplinary team that meets at the Family Justice Center where all of our partners are present and we round table these difficult cases and we come up with solutions, not just in cases where charges are filed, but on cases where charges weren't filed, but we need to work together to protect the family. So we've got this incredible system where we might have a case starting at the top, at the criminal justice level, and me saying I can't file and referring it down. Or I get calls from my partners saying we have a victim that's not satisfied with the law enforcement response and we think there's something more. Can you help us work with law enforcement to help them build a better case? So it might start at the bottom and come back up. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? What happens when I do file a case? Uh, one of the things I've learned from working with Stand um, is that when you ask victims what they want, and this is what I heard when, when Rhonda spoke at the Stand luncheon last week, what does a victim want? 
uh, they don't want the relationship to end most of the time. And I tell victims constantly, I am not the relationship police. It's not my job to tell you who to be in a relationship with or to break up your family. And there's this perception that if there's a prosecution, then the relationship has to end and the family has to end. And the abuser needs to come out, the children lose a parent, the family is, is broken apart. We believe in whole families and safe families for everybody. Most of our prosecutions don't result in someone going to prison. Most of our prosecutions result in probation. And in California, to make sure that we're getting interventions to help build stronger and safer relationships in, uh, uh, for families, the terms of probation, which is a judge supervising somebody back out in the community, they're set by law. And by law, somebody who's con convicted of domestic violence has to do an anger management class. Not a little tiny one, but a big one that deals with relationship violence. And it's a 52-week program. Stand runs one of the best programs in our county for people who hurt. And it is a program that works through interpersonal violence issues, and it's two hours a week for a whole year. Um, among the other terms of probation that are required by law are protective orders. Even if a victim doesn't want one yet, sometimes we have to step in and say, wait. And I'll tell victims, you know what? Let your partner earn you back. Let your partner demonstrate that they're serious about changing and getting help, and our judge supports us on this. When they do half the classes, if our victim really wants the order changed, we have the victim come to court. And in our courtroom, we have our stand advocate to make sure that the victim isn't being pressured or bullied or abused to remove that restraining order. The victim can speak confidentially with a stand advocate in court and make sure that is really what he or she themselves wants to do and not what they're doing because they're getting pressures from somebody else to do that. We do have people spend time in jail. Because again, you have kids, when they do a bad thing, there's gotta be a consequence to drive home the message of your behavior needs to change. Uh, we also craft special probation terms to try to address triggers to violence. We understand mental health is a huge issue for interpersonal violence. We understand that addiction can be a huge issue. And so part of our probation terms might be that a person has to um, get a mental health evaluation and, and keep all of their medical appointments and take all of their prescribed medication as directed and the court is going to weigh in on whether or not that person is doing so. We might find that somebody has an addiction issue and so we'll order with the court enforcing that order that they go into a treatment program for that addiction, that they have random drug testing, um, that they be subject to search so that our law enforcement partners can make sure that they're not using or possessing controlled substances. We'll talk to victims that say when he's clean, he's an incredible father. We'll talk to victims who say when she's taken her medication, she's a wonderful partner. And so if we can use probation to address those triggers, we can restore families to health and safety. Um, we might find that parenting challenges, relationships where they weren't ready to introduce a child, very young partners, that creates incredible stress. And maybe by requiring parenting classes, we can take some of the family stresses out and help get a, a healthy relationship back. All victims of crime are entitled to restitution for all economic losses. And when you do a bad thing, part of making it right is making that person whole again. So if somebody has harmed, they pay the costs of that harm, whether it's medical expenses, uh, relocation costs, home security costs, counseling costs. Uh, part of probation is when there is a violation, so you break one of the rules that the judge is enforcing, then you have to be accountable for that to the judge not to the partner. It's very difficult in a relationship to set rules for your abusive partner and then as the victim, be the one who has to enforce it. How are you gonna stand up to an abusive partner and tell them you promised me you'd go to drug treatment when they're using again and that's when they're violent? It's the judge that does that for our victims. The, if, if there's a violation, the person can be arrested by law enforcement, brought back to court and resentenced by the judge. Some of our offenders take great advantage of all of these resources and tools and they're committed to solving these problems in their relationship. Some of them aren't ready for it, just like victims aren't always ready in our timetable, offenders aren't ready in our timetable either, and they continue to have consequences with the court for failing to do that. Can we have the next slide, please? Our high-risk offenders go into a program that was a product of the Alliance. So this multidisciplinary 
team that includes probation, the public defender, our courts, the district attorney, and our community partners came up with a program of more intense court supervision for high-risk offenders. And we figure out who's high risk by using a tool to assess risk for domestic violence reoffense. It's called the ODARA tool. It's the Ontario Domestic Assault Risk Assessment Tool. But there's a lot of research showing that these 13 questions predict when an offender is going to abuse again. And those people that are at moderate to high risk go into a special program in our court. They get special attention from specially trained probation officers, from one judge, so we have uniform accountability. And in that program, we have incentives as well as consequences uh, in order to try to change behaviors. Um, and again, the goal is not to break families up and send people to prison and take them out of the community, but to fix what's causing the violence, create safe and whole families, and return them back to the community. Uh, and the last thing that probably people don't know, when you look at what does the district attorney's office do, most people think I just send people to prison all day. Um, this was my team. This was my team with the Alliance when we all won an award. One of the things that we do is we're out in the community with the Domestic Violence Prosecution Unit. Our prosecutors are co-located at the Family Justice Centers. So we're there to work with advocates. We're there to work with law enforcement partners. We're there to sit down and talk with a victim when that needs to happen. We train our law enforcement partners. Um, Jason and Nicole have had to sit and listen to me and also my prosecutors on a bunch of different training topics, but not just listening to it from the prosecutor's perspective, but we're partnering with our community organization partners to bring culturally competent and effective training on behalf of our partners as well. Last year, we gave three really well-received trainings in partnership with the Rainbow Community Center to train law enforcement on implicit bias and how better to respond to domestic violence within the LGBTQ community. Um, we've trained a bunch of other professionals too, everywhere from the Contra Costa Bar Association uh, to um, police academies where we're talking to civ excuse me, citizens about how prosecutors respond to domestic violence. And we're out in the schools as well. So uh, a little bit more well-rounded as prosecutors than you might think. Um, and again, the goal is safe families, safe communities, and partnership and collaboration across all of our systems. So with a few minutes left, I wanna make sure, are there any questions? We're gonna answer sort of our question and answer period. Uh, yes. That's really deep, and, it's, and, I, and I don't mean that lightly, um, because the issue is uh, for a child abuse and a mandated child abuse reporter, it, the child is at the focus, right? But for victims, adult victims of domestic violence, they are at the center. So we have to walk this razor's edge, and we do it with EHSD, with CFS, with Children and Family Services and Adult Protective Services and such, to really uh, do the least amount of harm and still follow the law. You have to follow the law. That's at the end, at the end of the day. We, we also struggle. Uh, at stand because on one hand we're mandated reporters and those of us who are licensed have to follow that mandate but when the and the federal law and the state law are different so what I'm saying is I feel you and it's a really deep issue which you have to have a consistent way of doing it within each school and it's a very difficult issue in schools because all of your teachers are mandated reporters so um, we always go for safety and that's what drives every decision we make clear as mud yeah uh, yeah, I can also add that 
even if the child is not a, the victim themselves who have been hit or abused, witnessing abuse is still a form of child abuse that we can add a charge against the suspect for committing any type of physical abuse to another their partner um, in front of the child, any, anybody under the age of 18 that lives in their home. Um, it is a crime that we can charge. So, yeah. So if I, yes, and I, I have to, this is a really complicated <laughs> issue because um, throughout our systems, people are making judgment calls every day. So law enforcement has to make a judgment call on the scene. You and the school have to make a judgment call about what to do, even when you're considering safety. And child welfare has to make a judgment call about what is or isn't child abuse. So what I, I just want to caution us, because it's a very, um, it's, it's very complicated in terms of making those judgments, and we're working really hard to make sure we're making uh, the judgment calls that keep safety at the center. And I just wanted, so I just wanted to note that. And I wanted to just add, even though you didn't ask this question, I thought you might be hinting at it, which is schools play such a critical role from a prevention standpoint. You know, statistically, as um, our officers have pointed out to the impact on children, but statistically, the number one most protective factor, the thing that will help children, because children react differently to violence and abuse, even when you suspect and know, is a caring adult. And you already know that. But I just have to say that the climates that the schools can create, you will be planting the seed for resilience and statistically, we know that's true because a very high percentage of children are resilient, but there is a reason why they were resilient. So I just want to say that really obvious thing, but for other people in the room, and the schools in our county have been really stepping up to look at how do we train our teachers around recognizing children who are in distress, being trauma-informed, and creating a climate where the student population understands what a healthy interaction looks like and what a healthy relationship is, which is social emotional learning and integrating that into curriculums and et cetera. So I just wanted, you didn't ask that, but I think it's a, it was um, a really important point that you were making overall, so. I think it's also important to remember that just because you make a report doesn't mean that the child's gonna be removed, right? Like that, it doesn't work that way. And if you have that, that feeling, you know, that something's happening, report it. And what do you think for the for the school guidelines and the inconsistencies that Mr. Ian brought up? Is it more could like another state mandate or federal, or should it be more localized with the specifics of that school district? In your opinions, do you think one approach might work better than others, or is it uh, unknown? <laughs> I, I think it is training across the board. I worked in education about 15 years ago, and and everyone had a different idea of of when to call, how how to report. Filling out a report is like was a nightmare then. I mean, but it's 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 just a consistent training on when to report, how to report, and um, how to follow up. Do we have another question from someone in the audience? I remember I had one. Uh, you know, when we were talking about, um, you said uh, not everyone when something when something bad happens, we're trained as little kids to call nine one one. And sometimes someone might not want to call and, and hold someone accountable, report something, um, and maybe not ready to call 911. What are the uh, what are the problems you guys are seeing by people calling 911 immediately, and what are other resources? So I actually got to talk to the Antioch Youth Leadership um, a couple weeks ago when I came out here to check out this facility, and. Uh, there were about maybe 30 or 40 kids in the room, and th this is what we talked about. As when, when we're all trained from this small, when something bad happens, who do you call? And they all raised their hands and said 911. Um, and we went over, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And the answer to every question I posed them was always call 911. But do you know what happens when you call 911? When you call 911, you get a police response. And a lot of our families are calling 911 because they don't know what else to do, but they don't want the police response. And so we're seeing time and time again that uh, and, and law enforcement, they will respond. They have to respond. These are priority responses because we never know which one of these responses is a homicide that we could prevent. So you will always have law enforcement take every domestic violence call very, very seriously. And you heard that from our partners today. But when our families, when our victims, when our callers then are angry and upset, 
because calling 911 got them the law enforcement response. It's very hard for us. They're limited in what they can do. They will show up in a patrol car, in a uniform, and if there's probable cause to arrest, they're required to do that. We will have victims say, but I don't want him arrested. I just want you to make him leave. Well, how long ago was that the only response we had, Rhonda? 20 or 30 years ago, that was the only response. They'd separate the parties. They would take him. It was always him, right? And they'd make him walk around the block, and he might walk right around back and finish what he started. And we had homicides. So we don't do that anymore. The legislature created a response system for law enforcement to require them to take these calls so seriously. And now our partners in law enforcement do it because they believe in it. But when our victims tell us, no, we have to say, I'm sorry, but we still need to do this. So the message we want to come out tonight is if the response that the victim family really wants is not a law enforcement response, but there's a different level of intervention that could take care of the problem, maybe before it gets to the point where someone is hurt or before it gets to the point where the children are seeing an extreme situation, there are so many levels of community response. Remember my triangle. The big part of the triangle at the bottom is our community partners. And you've heard tonight, you've seen them all here. We have amazing community partners uh, in organizations like STAND, in our faith-based community, in, culture comp in culturally competent organizations that you can find that would be a good fit for a situation to de-escalate and pro provide support services and resources so maybe some of these families will never have to call 911. All right, thank you. Ooh, we have one more question. Mm Uh, so far, I can only speak from my experience, I would say a lot of it goes unreported among teenagers, um, uh, which is unfortunate. And I think there needs to be a lot more awareness in that community to let them know that they have the freedom to call the police and report any type of threats or harassment or cyber abuse and stuff like that. I have taken several reports where somebody has used a social media platform or an app to commit a crime or post something inappropriate or threaten somebody. And we do take those um, as much as we can get from either writing a search warrant and getting the evidence from the app itself, the, the company that owns it, or taking pictures of whatever evidence we have on the person's cell phone. Uh, we can use those things to help with evidence for the crime that's occurred. But I w a lot of it goes unreported because um, I think it's more common in a younger generation than the older generations. We teach that stalking investigation is homicide prevention. Uh, stalking is a really misunderstood crime in the community, and what it is is a pattern of annoying and harassing behavior with a credible threat of great bodily harm. And uh, we've gotten the message to law enforcement, so now they bring me patterns of annoying and harassing behavior, um, and they'll bring me 20 police reports where he's annoying and harassing her or she's annoying and harassing him, but I don't have that threat yet. Uh, so we know that threat can be implied by a course of conduct. So if there's violence, I will file stalking over that entire period of time because obviously a, a, a physical act of violence is enough to convey a threat of future violence, and our courts are coming along and understanding that with us. Um, we see social media and electronic communication used incredibly to harass and intimidate people because you can sit on your phone all night long um, in the privacy of your own home and dictate threats and they get very colorful. Uh, and um, we have people who don't take them seriously until the perpetrator shows up um, with a gun or tries to break down the door. We've had some where the perpetrator after a series of electronic threats is at the home breaking down the door and you can hear the screaming hysterical victim on the phone with 911. We want the call before it gets to that point. And it's the victim thinking, well, he hasn't done anything yet and I, I'm okay. And again, we're taking this as homicide prevention. If the victims aren't sure, they should talk to stand 
and do safety planning with an advocate. That is critically important because if you're not sure that you're at risk, talk to a professional who can help you figure it out. And then those same professionals can advocate with you and help you work with law enforcement to get law enforcement involved and build a prosecution if that's the appropriate level of response to. One, one of the things we know is when a young person is, is experiencing a threat or has been assaulted, sexual assault, partner violence, who do, who do they tell most often? Nine times out of a 10, 99 times out of 100, they don't talk to someone who looks like me. They talk to a friend. They talk to someone who's their own age. So the, the biggest weapon we can do is to continue to non-normalize these behaviors. And I know it, it comes down to parents and communities and faith communities and neighborhoods and aunties. This is non-normal and you don't have to put up with it. And that's a really hard message. I think it's become very normalized. I appreciate what Officer Riddick was saying, that it's, it's private, it's quiet, it's lethal. What we also know about people who stalk and who pe uh, people who, let me say this, what we know about victims who die at a stalker's hand is often he hasn't or she has never touched them. But then when they do, it's very lethal. So to take it seriously, this is not normal. And that's the new campaign. This ain't normal. So I would say that education has to be predominant. Started that tonight. So I want, if anyone has any other questions, uh, these panelists will stick around. Um, but I, let's give them a huge round of applause. These amazing panelists. Thank you so much. This has been an uh, eye opening conversation. And please give yourselves a round of a hand to come out, even though just to come out tonight and listen and come out and, and ask these questions. That, that's amazing. Thank you so much tonight for everyone uh, for coming to this forum. Yeah.